My name is Sarita Amrute. I'm the Director of Research at Data and Society. It's my sincere pleasure to welcome you tonight for the first of three Wednesdays feature featuring this year's fellow cohort talking about their work. Tonight, we'll hear from Chansey Fleet and Mutali and Conde. I'll next introduce Mutali and Conde, uh, who will be asking us, what do we know? The, in the inability to question Mark Zuckerberg in Congress. Mutale is a US-based policy analyst working at the intersection of race, technology, and policy. She has been a senior tech policy advisor for Congresswoman Yvette Clark since 2016, part of the team that helped introduce the Algorithmic Accountability Act into the House of Representatives in April 2019, so fresh, and is the founder of the Dorothy Vaughn Tech Symposium, a briefing series that takes place on Capitol Hill. Mutale co-authored a recent racial literacy and tech report, together with Jesse Daniels, who's in the house today. Um, and in addition to speaking widely on race, policy, and AI, her work has been covered in the MIT Tech Review. Welcome, Mutale. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You guys clearly do not go to church, <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't know that. So my name is Mitali Nkande. I have been a fellow here for the last year, and I'm, um, my expertise are in AI governance. People often ask me how I got into tech, and the truth of it is I never knew that I could even be in, in this field until I saw this picture. This was 2015, I was in between jobs and I was trying to figure out what next to do. And when I saw my uncle, Barack Obama, sitting next to my cousin <laughs> with braids, I was like, well, clearly I have to do this. It was a different time, we were all excited, and this interest in joining my uncle and my cousin turned into speaking, uh, volunteering widely with what were, at the time, like coding camps for people. So the assumption was the only reason that we weren't there was that we couldn't code and we couldn't code because we didn't like math and I was here to change it and that wasn't true and it didn't work out. But it did bring me into some really interesting conversations with Google around what it meant to have um, a fair, equitable and open workplace. And when I got the answers they gave me, I didn't like them, so I left. And I came into what is not what I call tech, but it's much more commonly called AI in the rooms that I entered. Artificial intelligence um, on Capitol Hill, where I spend most of my working time, is used in many different ways. It can be an adjective, a vowel, it could be a verb, it could be, we, you know, people refer to the artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence, but what's very clear is that people don't know what they're talking about. So one of my first jobs is often to let people know what AI represents. So the management consulting firm McKinsey did a report last year, and their prediction is that AI is going to add 3.5 trillion to 5.8 million in the world economy. So when I'm speaking in rooms in Washington, the, the thing that is often not said and the question that's often not posed is how are we going to capture that worth to the US economy. People like to think that the deployment of AI is only going to be in technical systems, but this, uh, this growth in our economy is going to be across 19 sectors. So everything from how we book travel to how we bank to how we fix machines are going to be part of a machine learning process. My question is, and the questions that I pose, is where is this value going to be added? And here's where it gets fun. The two top predictions are that the value will be added in personal advertising, <laughs> also known as, uh, which, which in plain men's terms is really the mining of our data, sometimes with but often without our opinion. And the exposure that I normally speak about in that context is privacy. Who gets it? What does it mean? And how do we ensure that we create legal frameworks that protect the most vulnerable? The other place that we're gonna, uh, gonna get this uh, add to our economy is improving our, our supply chain efficiency. 
What that basically means is that data is going to decide when and if a machine should be fixed, taking that, taking that work away from a human being and taking away those skill sets out of our economy. And so in that context, my question is, where is and could there be bias? But before I return to that, I want you to all realize how late the US were to the party. So the term AI was introduced in 1957 by a scientist called John McCarthy, where in a paper to go to the first conference on AI, on, on computers at that time, it wasn't AI, he coined the term. The next year, McCarthy developed the LIPS programming machine, and 59 years later, the US Congress takes notice. They did so in the form of the AI Futures Act, which is what's called a messaging bill. So this is not a piece of legislation that's meant to be enacted. It's more a piece of legislation that's meant to introduce new ideas into the marketplace. And it lays out four, the four, the four, um, I'm sorry. It lays out four priorities that guide my work. The first is the creation of an enabling business environment, something I leave to lobbyists and tech firms because that's not my forte, but the other three interest me deeply. Governments looking at the future of work, what does that mean? Privacy and bias. But please note that bias is at the very bottom of that list and is the least of the concerns of Congress at this time. In 2018, this was followed by the introduction of the Internet Bill of Rights by Ro Kahana, a Democrat from Silicon Valley. And in 2019, the first piece of legislation that was really looking at the question of bias was introduced, the Algorithmic Accountability Act, which I was honored to have a, have a role to play in that introduction with the congressperson I work with, Yvette Clark. She is the vice chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, so actually plays a leadership role around how the House is thinking about these issues. Now, these are the questions that, are, that most concern me. When we talk about the future of work, whose future is that? Is it the future of workers? How are our rights going to be impacted? And if machines do everything, like we heard, like we heard at, 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 I'm sorry, I'm so tired. I was in DC yesterday. If machines do everything, then what will people do? Because what we do in our work is so much more than tasks. It's often how we build our identities. It's often what, what molds our communities and gives us the sense of being. Can algorithms capture that? And if they cannot, what's going to happen to those that are left behind? And are those left behind going to be people like me? The second is privacy. Now, when we think about this, who are we actually talking about? If you live in public housing in Brownsville, should your face be your key? If your face is going to be your key in Brownsville, the bad news is your face is also going to be your key in the Upper West Side. So in the rooms that I occupy, when I think about privacy, I'm often also thinking about those people who have not historically been seen as people. And if they historically have not been seen as people, do they have this right? This is the question that's driving the facial recognition hearings in the House. What I predict will be a recommendation for a moratorium. But these are also not questions that are often asked in the design and the deployment of these technologies. And the final question that I'm really interested in is what is bias? What does it mean and who does it include? And if we don't have conversation about race, are we really gonna, have, gonna be able to have a conversation about bias? Existing civil rights frameworks do not allow for unintended consequences. Yet when I speak to engineers that I work alongside on Capitol Hill and we speak about the code that incriminates people like me for being me, they often come back and say, well, it was a mistake, it was a glitch, we didn't mean it. But if that leads to my imprisonment, if that leads to my children being taken away, that's an inadequate explanation. So, Today is about what I've done, but I'm also introducing what I'm going to be doing going forward. Over the next year, I'm going to be conducting an ethnographic study of congressional staffers because they claim to know about AI, but if you are talking to me about an AI or the AI, 
My guess is you probably don't know what you're talking about, and so I want to know how you know it. The people that are most, in, the people that have the most influence in Congress right now are tech staffers. I'm sorry, a tech lobbyist hired directly by firms, often to encourage at least the people I advise in the Congressional Black Caucus that they shouldn't worry nor think about these things. But often that everything's gonna be okay, they're gonna write new code and they're gonna fix it. And so I want to know how much influence do those people have? What are they saying? And do you understand what's being said once it's been put out there? I also want to know what happened in the Mark Zuckerberg hearing. For those who saw it, it was, I mean, it was really quite amazing. We had questions, everything from how do we challenge what's, how do we know what's in what's up? Because obviously end-to-end -end encryption is a secret on the Hill, to can you pull my personal file from Facebook? That level of inability to connect with the technical aspects of building code is something that we should all be worried about. And then the third part, part of that is, are our laws adequate? When we think about racism being deployed through proxies or gender bias being deployed just because na people named Jared do better at Amazon, I want to be able to find out whether we have the legal prowess that we need on the Hill to think about new frameworks that will allow us to think about a new reality one in which artificial intelligence technologies are not only going to add to the economy, but that that's an economy that's inclusive of everybody. Because if those questions are not asked, if we don't know about the technology, then we're screwed. Thank you.